Let's hope uh, people remember that we had a Devo 30. I've been gone for so long. I think I missed uh, Friday and, and Monday, huh? Yeah, I did. Well, good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. Brett, we'll wait a couple of seconds here. Okay, there's a person. It's on. Interesting. So I have been gone the last few days at a California renewal project, which is a political uh, group that is trying to change California uh, to a more biblical California. I know that sounds impossible, but uh, some good things are, are happening. I've met some, some great people. Uh, I, I don't know what other word to use than poli politicians, though I don't like that word politicians. These are believers who have a biblical worldview that are running for certain offices, like John Cox who's running for mayor, for mayor, and he is so close. He is, he is this close that if our church, I think, would vote, all of them, if everyone voted who were legally registered and so forth, I think that he could win. That's how close he is. And that's how important us voting uh, is. Uh, at this point in time. So John Cox and, uh, yeah, did I say mayor? I always say mayor, governor, governor, I'm sorry. I get those two mixed up when I'm speaking. So the governor, yeah, because Jerry Brown will be out <clears throat> and we don't want the next Democrat in, by the way, because from what I hear, it will be worse than what it is now. They estimated that a million people have left California because of what's going on. And let me just say this, and I say this lovingly from my heart, is that's a shame. You know, we're so used to running as people. We, we, we run from situations. We run from trials. We run from struggles. We run from California because we don't like what's going on. We run from church because we don't like what's going on in church. And we're a bunch of runners. You know, kind of like a dog that runs and puts its tail between its legs, you know, and says, I'm out of here. And it's sad. A million people leaving California that don't like what's going on. How about if those million people voted? California would be different if they would vote it. It's amazing how many Christians <clears throat> there are <clears throat> in our state, and yet they don't vote. During the primary, which we just had, it's something like 15% vote. That's ridiculous. During a presidential, it's a little bit higher. But they think the, the primaries are, are really not as important as the presidential. <clears throat> so during this next election, which is coming up November 4th, I believe, which is on a Tuesday, there's going to be a low turnout. And this is our opportunity because in these low turnouts, Christians can actually come in and vote their biblical worldview and change this community. But we need to stop running. And I say, I, I hear people say, I'm leaving California. I'm tired of it. These are the same people that got Glocks, ARs, that are ready to fight and battle, but they're going to leave California because they don't like it anymore. They're going to run away. I'm like, why not stay and do something about it? Why not stay and fight? Stop running and start getting involved and in doing something about it. I mean, we're a people that run a lot away, and we need to not run away. We need to stand our ground, and we need to fight like Joshua, like David. And sometimes it means standing alone. And more than, more than not, it's a fight of standing alone. What did King Saul do? when Goliath came up to fight. He ran away. I can't do this. What did Israel do? They ran away. I can't do this. What happened? This little boy comes along, David. Says, who does this guy think he is? This uncircumcised Philistine. Can you imagine? That's a teenager, right? I mean, that's a teenager attitude. Who does he think he is? He's fighting against the most high God. And he grabs you know, several stones in case his brothers want to get involved. <laughs> And he takes a stone and hits David right between the eyes and he just falls and he grabs his sword like a man and he chops his head off and says, here's our God. See, that's what we ought to be doing is fighting instead of running like a dog between our legs. And there's a lot of guys out there who think they're tough because they got ARs and they got guns and they got their C CCWs. 
you know, or, or, or conceal carry weapons, CCWs, you know, but yet they can't stick around and fight. They're ready to go to another state that's easier, that allows uh, their guns, allows, you know, conservative thoughts and so forth. And you know what? Get in the battle and fight. Anyway, enough of that. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us. Today we stream live on Facebook, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If you're in the neighborhood, like these good people here, including my wife, she's there. Um, you can join us here at the church at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Today we will be in the book of Luke and continue on in chapter 10. So let's pray. Gracious Father, we come before you this morning uh, to begin, uh, or actually to to hit this Wednesday, I'm a little lost in days, Lord, as I've been gone. But to get, again, just this Wednesday, Lord, to begin the day with you in our minds and thoughts, Father. Would you minister to us, encourage us, and strengthen us, Father, with your biblical truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Jesus continues on in Luke chapter 10, if you'd like to turn your Bibles there. And by the way, please share this video on your wall. The more people that watch the more it will be ministered to by the truth, the Word of God. Statistically, there, again, is a low number of people that even read their Bibles. And I'm saying less than 18% read their Bibles. So that means in this room alone, there's probably only three or four that read their Bible on a regular basis. And that means we have a people that are illiterate when it comes to the Scripture. In Paul's day, in Jesus' day, when they're writing this and speaking to their, the people, they're literate of the scriptures. They read. They didn't have TV, MTV. They didn't have all these AMCs. They didn't have TBS. They didn't have HGTV. They didn't have that stuff. So what did they do? They read their Bibles, their scriptures. They went to synagogues. They knew what was going on. So when Paul's speaking to them, he was speaking to them about things they knew. When I speak today and pastors speak today to, to the people in, in the church, he's speaking to people that are illiterate of the scriptures. And that's why the church is in the position that it is in today, because we have a lot of illiterate people who don't know their word. And we need to pull this thing out and start reading it. And so Jesus is, is, is a great person to, to really go to and find biblical truth. He's the plumb line of that biblical truth. You know what a plumb line is, right? It... it measures it, it actually straightens everything out you, you tie a rope on a weight that's got a point and you pin it up in any roof any any top and let it fall it will be straight there's never been a plumb line that's crooked if it finds something that's crooked it's usually the wall that's crooked or the thing that it's measuring that's what is crooked this is our plumb line and if it's going to find anything crooked it's going to be us that are crooked and not the word of god because this should be our biblical uh, truth, our grid for truth. Not emotions and not feelings, but the Word of God. We do not walk by sight, by feelings and emotions. We walk by faith. So saying that, Jesus now is going to send his 70 disciples out to the community. Now, how scary is that? That can be very emotionally scary. I know that because to get people to go out and share their faith from a church, don't want to do that because that's scary. What do I say? What do I do? You know, I don't know what to do. And they need to be equipped for that. So he sends them out because he knows that in the future, they are going to need to know that they have to depend on Jesus 100% as they go out and share the gospel. And so he's training them. He's giving them opportunities to stretch their faith. So verse 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and placed where he himself was about to go. Now, in the context, understand what's going on in Israel at this time. Uh, it, it's probably just like today. There is a lot of debates. There is a lot of political agendas. You have the Sadducees. You have the Sad. You have the Pharisees. You have the Sanhedrins. You have the Hellenists. You got the Greeks. You got the Jews. You got Rome and Empire. You got all this kind of melting pot of people and politics going around all over the place. You got Pilate, who's who's in trouble with Rome, who's struggling in keeping order within the community of Israel and Judea, uh, and he's in trouble for it. You have the Jews who are using him politically to get their way in the community, threatening to tell Rome about him. 
And that's some authority and power for a religious group to have. Kind of like the Catholic Church who has some power when it comes to politics too. And some churches who have power. Uh, they do have power. They do have authority. They have a right to express their religious views to politicians. Trump is gathering with religious people all the time to understand Christianity, to understand the, the struggles within the culture of our day today. And so this is what's going on at that time. And Jesus is dealing with this and he's sending his 12 out into this kind of situation. And it says in verse two, then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way, behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. And he made that very clear. I mean, that is a pep talk, right? <laughs> he didn't say, hey, go out there. I'm with you. I got you. Nothing will happen to you. No, I'm sending you like a lamb to a wolf. And get that picture in your mind. Because Put a lamb in the midst of a bunch of wolves. What happens? Poor lamb, it's gone. It's lamb chops. And it's lamb chops for him. He's devoured. Why would Jesus tell them that? That statement in itself would say, okay, I'm not going because <laughs> I know what's going to happen. But he sends them out that way to let them know that, look, I am in control and you are among the midst of wolves and you're going to see my power displayed in, in your lives. Carry neither money bags, sacks, nor sandals and greet no one along the road. But... Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house with people and so forth. You got a mission. You make sure you keep your eyes on the mission. Don't divert from that. Don't get involved in other issues. Just keep going. And when you get there, work and eat and get ready to go again is what he's saying. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Verse 9, and heal the sick who are there. And say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. Now he's talking about Jesus and his kingdom coming to them now. In other words, the Messiah is here. The promised one to the Jews has come as prophesied in the Old Testament. He is here and there is hope for Israel if you will hear. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. So even those cities that reject you and push you away, just brush the dust off your feet, judgment will come upon them. But I say to you, verse 12, that it will be more tolerable in the day of Sodom than for that city. And woe to you, Chorazans, woe to you, Bethsidia. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented a great while ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. In other words, if I would have done what, what I've done with you cities, like I, with Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented, but you won't. Your heart is so hardened from that truth. And there's so many people that even sit in the pews in the churches that are so hardened to the truth. Again, the illiteracy of the scriptures because they don't really believe it. They've been um, told that the Bible is not God's word. Do you know that pastors were polled over 60% pastors don't believe that the Bible is the inerrancy word of God. That's who's teaching from the pulpit. And so that's why they have to find other material like AMC movies to get good material to minister to their emotional needs instead of giving them the plumb line of the word of God. That's a sad commentary. And then you take those pastors that do believe it, aren't even teaching it, or they shy away from it because it's too controversial or it's political. I love what one guy said. If I were to say back 30 years ago, homosexuality is a sin, you would say, yes, it is. Today, don't touch it. That's a political issue. If I were to say that marriage is between a man and a woman 30 years ago, you'd say, of course it is. Today, you don't touch that. It's political. And so the churches are now looking at everything that we talk about from a moral perspective as political because the culture is saying it's political. It's not political. It's biblical. And we need to get back to biblical truth. And Calvary chapels are those who are in the vanguard, up front, that's what it means, in the front of the war and battle, teaching the word of God. They love the sheep, but they're not going to tolerate those sheep or that call themselves sheeps and they're not being biblical 
Uh, it's time for the church to rise up. I'm a little excited because of these last two meetings, as you can tell. So I apologize if I'm overexcited. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I appreciate that. So let's move on. So Jesus uh, sends them out. Judgment will come upon them, but it'll be more tolerable for Siddim in the judgment than you. And you, verse 15, in Capernaum, who are altered uh, to heaven, will be thrust down to Hades. He who hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. By rejecting the word of God from a pastor, from those that are evangelizing, you're rejecting God. Plain and simple, that's biblical truth. No, no, but what if you got it wrong? No, if it's the word of God, you're rejecting God if someone is telling you the truth. Now, the 70 come back and they're a little excited. Then the 70 return with joy, verse 17, saying, the Lord, even the demons are subjected to us in your name. And he said to them, I told you, you'll be among wolves, but there's gonna be some power there. And I say, Satan fell like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in the book of life or in heaven. What he's saying is, look, guys, I've given you that authority and that power to go out. And he still has given us that authority and power. And when we go out, let's not marvel over that. Let's marvel at the fact that we have eternal life, that if the wolves devour us, we go to heaven. Straight pass. Pass goal straight there. We're, we're there. We don't have to worry. But also understand this, that these signs and wonders are also condemning those that you're ministering to, and their names are not written in the book of life. So what he's saying is, I believe, is he's saying the importance of eternal life. That's the point. However the means you get there, you got to get them to the point of eternal life. Whether you're giving out all the food. Oh, Lord, they're, they're taking all the food. We gave away a 1,000 pounds of food. This was great. This is awesome. No, the point is, who received the Lord Jesus Christ? Was the gospel preached? Does someone hear the name of Jesus? Rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. Those things are means to get the gospel out. Whether it's political, whether it's handing out food, whether it's feeding the homeless, whatever it is. Whether it's having a, a, a school to bring people in to teach for, privately from a church perspective so that you reach the souls of those little children. It's always an opportunity to reach them with the gospel. This is what Jesus is saying. Verse 21, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father in heaven. And no one knows who the Son is but the Father and who the Father is but the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. And he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it and to hear what you have hear and have not heard it. In other words, you're not like everyone else who is following the culture. You actually see what's happening. You see that I am the Son of God, that I am the Messiah. And God is showing you and revealing these things to you. You couldn't see it on your own. But I'm showing it to you and you're blessed for being able to see it. And by the way, we're like that today. Same thing's happening. People don't see what's in front of them. When they come to church, they're not seeing Jesus. They're trying to pick out some, some moral value that they can live by. That's not the point. There's a lot of good moral things that be taught in scriptures, but that's not why Jesus came to give us moral values. He came to save our souls. And people are looking for moral values. How do I know this? Because watch their Facebook. Watch their Facebook's pages and watch what they post. They don't post scriptures, Not a, a lot of them do, but a lot of them don't. What do they post? They're posting great little uh, sound bites, you know, something that sounds positive, something that sounds uh, good, something that, you know, uh, the famous one is, you know, uh, you don't have to, no, everyone doesn't have to like you, you know, or the best friends are those friends that, you know, stick with you. These type of little sayings like, that just have no real meaning. They're all emotional posts. They have no biblical uh, emphasis at all. And we need to post biblical stuff. We need to post scriptures. What's wrong with posting just the scripture itself and let it speak for itself? It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce the heart and the intent of a man. That's pretty powerful. Uh, Brad Pitt's little quote, that's not powerful at all. There's no power behind that at all. 
the, it, it does hit the entertaining and the emotional and the heart, but there's no power there behind it. Um, we need to be careful that we're not posting cultural things because they feel good. We need to po uh, post truth. So what is important is eternal life. So look at verse 25. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? Now, he, a he asked this specifically and purposely because it's true what the lawyer is going to say, but it's impossible, and we have to understand that. We don't get from this little thought that, oh, we could be into heaven by our works, because you can't. And so the, the lawyer answers and says, you shall love, your, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and, with all, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this, and you'll live. And if I were to look at the Greek, it probably says in the present tense, continually do this. That means continue and linearly. And that means starting at a point and never stopping. And you'll live. In other words, if you can be perfect in the law, fulfilling every commandment of God, you can enter into heaven. But you can't. Because that's what the Bible says. And not only does the Bible say that, but you know that you have not kept the commandments of God. Have you ever told a lie? You just broke the law. And now you're guilty. And now you have to find some other way to get to heaven. And so Jesus is telling this lawyer, yeah, you think that's the law. Go ahead. Keep it all. And then you'll get to heaven. But the lawyer is going to find, I can't. So what do you need? You need Jesus. So he gives an example of servanthood here, verse 29. And he, but he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You see, because now he's, he's kind of like, I can't keep it. So who's my neighbor? I can love a Jew. I can love my family. But a Samaritan? Somebody that's not? No, I'm not. See, I can't keep it. And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Isn't it interesting? This happens today. People are mugged all the time and left there. And we have opportunities to minister to them. Girls that are raped. Girls that are in trafficking. We have opportunities to... This is what the church should be doing. Being good Samaritans. Now... By chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He didn't want to bother with him. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at a place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Now, of course, those are religious people who say they keep the law, but there's no compassion there. But a certain Samaritan, he, as he journeyed, uh, came where, it, where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, went to him and uh, bandaged his wounds, pouring an, an, on oil, and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. That's the Christian right there. That's what we should be doing. How many times? It doesn't matter. As many times as God gives you opportunity, and it's in your means to do so. It, we shouldn't get tired of doing that. If you're getting tired of doing that, then you need to re-examine your heart where your heart is. Because being a servant and a slave is not one that's only periodically. The punctual action in the Greek is not just... There you are, you're a slave. Now you're done. No, it's you're a slave always. And when there's opportunity for you to serve, you serve. It never stops. It keeps going until the day you die. God has raised up servants. I come to serve and not to be served. That's what Jesus said. And he served from the day that he was born until the day he went to that cross. And he's still serving today. As the Bible says, he makes intercession. He makes intercession um, the right hand of the Father for us every single day, serving us through prayer. If anything, you can pray continually. That's the Christian's life. We need to understand that truth. And so he did that with compassion. He went to him, bandaged him. Verse 35, the next day when he departed, he, he took out two dineros, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will come again and repay you. <clears throat> so, which of these do you think was his neighbor to him who fell along the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go likewise and do. That's a command, by the way. Go likewise and do. And so go and likewise do. Here's the application for us today because it hasn't changed, right? They're living in a culture and a time that, that's corrupt and evil and wicked. You have a Roman government that wants to rule the world. 
We have a, a form of government that wants that same thing. There is an exponential growth in one world government today. You ever, you ever cut a snail in half and you see those rings? You ever see those little rings that grow in a snail? You see a, a, a shell and they're like little, yeah. Those are expositional growths. It starts off little, little, and if you measure those, they're all exactly a certain degree as they grow. And in fact, it's a natural thing. You measure a, a, a hurricane, it's the same expositional growth. You see a hurricane, how it starts off little and grows? It's the same thing with one world government. When you trace back world history to the point where we can actually record it, you start with those leaders that wanted to rule the world, like the Pope, and then kings and so forth. It's an expositional growth. And today, it's at the end where it's so big that the whole world now is involved. And so there's a push to one world government. And how do you get one world government? You get one world, one world government by liberalism. You, you put the people in slavery. How do you put the people in slavery? You have them depend upon the government to survive. So you give them things. Give them free phones. They'll love you to death. Give them vouchers to get food every periodically. They'll love you to death. Give them jobs? No, we don't want them jobs because then they won't be dependent on us. They'll be free to work and do what they want with their money. And so you enslave the people. And as you enslave the people, they want you more. And so they vote for you because you're giving them things. That's liberalism. That's de democracy. It's not capitalism and it's not republicanism, which this nation was founded on republicanism, right? It used to be a republic nation. And that's what we're trying to get back to is capitalism. Because now you give me money, I work for that money, now I do with my money what I want. I don't need you, government. Get out of my way. I'll go and buy what I want to buy. I'll give to whatever I want to give. I'll live the way I want to live. That's capitalism, and it actually works. And so how do you create a one-world nation? You enslave the people. You enslave the people. <clears throat> and they disguise themselves, don't they? You remember Judas Iscariot? When they were giving to the treasury and they wanted to spend some of it, actually the woman spent the oil and Judas said what? Lord, we should keep that. And what do we should do with it? We should give it to the poor. We should give it to the, the poor, poor, poor people. Jesus, I can almost see him crying. It's poor people. We love them to death. We really love them. <laughs> but he said that, the scripture says, why? Because he was stealing from the treasury. How about all those politicians like, we need to give to the poor. We need to pay for their education. We need to do all this. But what are they doing? They're stealing from the treasury. Because you look at how they're living. Yeah. You look how they're living. And see, those are the elite that are trying to make you poor so they can live way up there on top and rule the world because they all want to rule. He closes with <clears throat> a contrast of what true servants is. Now, it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at the feet of Jesus and heard his words. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, 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 you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen the good part of it, which will not be taken away. Which good part? Sitting at the feet of Jesus. He didn't say, stop serving. He just said, sit for a while. Enjoy me. Have a relationship. This is why I don't like, I don't agree with organized religion. I agree that the church is an organism. It's made up of people. And we're a lot bigger than just this church here. We're around the world and we are the church and the church needs to sit at the feet of Jesus because it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ it's not about the church you go to the name of that church or the false doctrines of that church or let's just say cultural doctrines of that church but it's about the church being in touch with Jesus, coming together to hear about Jesus, worship Jesus, put Jesus at the center, and preach Jesus. It's all about Jesus, and that's what he's saying here. There's going to be plenty of time to serve, and there will be opportunities to serve, but we've got to sit at the feet of Jesus. This is why we pray before we serve Sunday mornings, and it's so important, guys. 
that you drop your ministries right there. It's better to drop them right there, be here at 915, and we pray and then go do it. God will bless it even more because he wants us in prayer and, and to realize, re-adjine, uh, realign, just like the chiropractor realigns our, our body, it gets in tune and it falls where it's supposed to, and then we go do it. And we're, we'll be fine and blessed by the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we just pray, oh, Father in heaven, that we would take the opportunity to spend time with you today, Lord. Even as if, if it's a few seconds here and there, just saying, thank you, Lord, for my salvation. Thank you, Lord, for my breath. Thank you, Lord, for my life. Thank you that my name is written in heaven. We give you praise and glory, Father. May you take your truth, your word, your plumb line, the grid of truth, your word, Father, and just apply it to our hearts. Help us, Lord, not to move emotionally, Father, but to have right emotions, and that is gridded by the truth of God so that when we do do something, it's with compassion and love and mercy, but it's done in the right way, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for viewing Devo 30. We're going to take some time and, and pray. So if you have any prayer requests, please uh, post them on uh, this page here or private message me and we will pray for you. And also remember, hit that share button and share this message with those around you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. And if you're in the area, come to church tonight. We're in Leviticus chapter 8 and we're looking at the high priest as God gives them instructions on how they ought to minister in the temple. God bless you guys.